Here at IFL Science, we like to discuss the cutting edge and the future, but sometimes it's important to look back at the past. I'm Dr. Alfredo Carpinetti, and I would like to invite you on a journey as we turn the clock back 55 years to the 28th of November, 1967. That day, just outside Cambridge in England, an astronomical discovery was going to take place that would change the world. Jocelyn Bell Burnell, then a graduate researcher, discovered pulsars, a pulsating type of neutron stars, one of the most extreme objects in the universe. The discovery began a revolution in what we know, what we can test, and what might exist at the very limit of physics. Professor Bell Burnell, thank you so much for joining us today. Could My you take your... Could you take us back 55 years to 1967 and how, and tell us how the discovery of the pulsars came about? I was a graduate student at the time in Cambridge, England, which I felt to be very prestigious. Um, so prestigious that I did not think I should be there. I think they'd made a mistake admitting me. And I'm working very hard so as not to be thrown out. <laughs> and because I'm working very hard and very thoroughly, I'm noticing things. I'm, I have my eyes open, as they say. So I've spent two years building a radio telescope. This is pretty heavy physical work. A lot of wire, cable, ropes, things like that. Um, and in the third year, which is the final year of the program in Britain, um, I'm taking data, collecting data and analyzing data. The project is actually to look for quasars, quasi-stellar radio sources, which were the very hot topic at that point. And to look for them, I was working with high time resolution, very short integration times because the quasars should be flickering, changing brightness. It's not intrinsic to the quasar, it's because of the propagation through space to reach the Earth. And I'm being very thorough because, you know, I'm stupid and I shouldn't be in Cambridge, et cetera, et cetera. And in amongst my miles of data, literally miles of data, I notice a quarter inch that has a signal that I don't understand, that I can't make sense of. And you kind of log these things at the back of your brain. And the second or third time I saw it, I thought, hmm, I've seen a signal like this before. I've seen a signal like this before from this bit of the sky, haven't I? And then it's quite easy because although I've got literally miles of this paper chart, I can, I now know which bits to look at. So I go back to all the previous observations of that bit of sky. And indeed on one or two or three occasions, not all, but several, there was this same curious signal. So I show it to my supervisor and he doesn't know what it is either. And he rightly observes that we're running the paper under the pen quite slowly. So everything gets jammed up. What we need is to run the paper fast so that everything gets spread out and we can see properly what this signal is. So after about a month of failing, I finally get this thing and it's pulsing regularly with a period of one and a third seconds, like nothing else we have ever seen. And of course, my thesis advisor doesn't believe me, but comes out the next day uh, looks over my shoulder and sees it with his own eyes. And that's where the excitement began, because we had a detection of something that we couldn't explain. Wow. Um, and also, I think it's a great message about uh, when uh, we all suffer from imposter syndrome, that uh, we need to persevere and uh, keep working hard and clearly <laughs> This discovery proves that imposter syndrome, uh, can, you can work through it. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for that story. 
in the, um, the five and a half decades since uh, that momentous day, our understanding of Pulsar has expanded enormously. What do you think are some of the most significant milestones? Uh, We've found some that we, the community, have found some that's been extremely fast. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, why don't they fly apart, centrifuge apart? Uh, clearly, they're very compact and held together by very strong gravity. We now understand them to be what we call neutron stars, which are tiny. They're only about 10 miles across not 10 to the power something, 10, simply 10 miles across. And they have the mass of a typical star like the sun, all crammed into that tiny, tiny ball. So there's some extreme physics within the star, as well as peculiar behavior observed by it from outside. So lots of fascinating physics coming out of these things and still coming out of these things. I think it's uh, it's it's incredible how much uh, uh, we have learned, uh, not just uh, when it comes to Pulsar, but uh, how much the scientific and the general world has changed in the last uh, uh, 55 years. Uh, when we consider uh, science, or physics in particular, what do you think have been, uh, is there anything actually that has not been discovered or confirmed uh, that you expected uh, back then uh, that by now we would have uh, uh, an answer to? There are probably quite a lot of things, but also we've, you know, for instance, discovering these pulsars, very compact, very small objects, made black holes seem much more likely, more plausible. And they started discovering black holes just a few years later. Those were black holes, the mass of a star, but we... Now I know that there are massive black holes at the centers of galaxies, for instance. So it's been very, very fast moving astrophysics altogether. Um, one of the things that I'm most excited by is um, I was working in radio astronomy. It was a fairly new branch of astronomy. Until then, there'd really only been optical astronomy, you know, looking through telescopes to see the light from stars which incidentally wouldn't show pulsars because they don't give any light. Uh, so we've extended you know, to radio astronomy and infrared and X-ray and ultraviolet and gamma ray and so on. So there's been a lot happening like that. Um, each new window opening actually often raises as many questions as there are answers. And we are now also moved into a whole new spectrum called gravitational radiation, gravitational waves, which I'm delighted I've been around to see. I, I knew they'd be found someday. So that's got some fun stuff. And then there's also the particles associated with the, the light and the gamma rays and the a radio and the X-rays. So we're beginning to, to, detect, to detect some neutrinos from cosmic events. Um, we've studied cosmic rays for quite a long time. There's been huge advancement in my life and there's so much new stuff coming online that it, it takes time to absorb um, and actually understand fully what it's telling us. But there's a huge amount going on. That is, uh, that is a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask you, what motivates you to pursue a career in science? It turned out that I was good at science, well, some science, as soon as we started doing it. Um, when I was about age ooh, 11, 12, um, it's when in the British school system you start doing a lot of new subjects. And they wouldn't let girls do science. Boys did science. Girls learned cookery and needlework. So I had a fight to get into the science class. But when I got into the science class, we did physics that first term and I came top of the class. Um, so justifying my position in the class. Um, uh, and I've loved science, especially physics ever since. So I'm extremely glad that I got in to do that physics class. 
things that you like, you're often quite good at. So I found a lot of physics quite easy. So that always helps as well. Lots of developments in, in astronomy, astrophysics through my lifetime. Um, lots of excitement. Um, no regrets. I've really had a ball. There's been so much going on. <laughs> And since you mentioned your uh, younger self, what kind of advice would you give uh, uh, to her? Hmm. Well, I would say have a go at everything you've got to have a chance at having a go at. Try it. You don't really know until you try something whether you take to it, whether you like it, whether you're good at it. So be open to trying lots of different things. And then as you get more senior, you'll be able to focus on those that you like and those that you're good at. And if it's physics, great. It's a super subject. Not enough girls do it. Too many girls are told physics is too difficult. It's for the boys. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. Do it. Try it. Have a go. That is fantastic advice. Uh and actually leads very well to the next question. You not only have contributed to starting a new field of astronomy, you also work on making science itself a better place for women and other underrepresented groups. What are you most proud of in this area and what do you hope to uh, maybe see or achieve in the future? One of the things that I've done, which wasn't of itself science, was to be part of a small group of senior women looking at how many women there are in science, usually in university science, um, in the different science subjects. And in biology, there's a fair number of women. In chemistry, there aren't so many, but there are some. In physics, until very recently, there have been very, very few. Women have been a minority in physics. And one of the things that I have done is working with a group of my peers, other women scientists of my age, is setting up a system whereby universities and industries can keep check on how many women they have, at which level. Are there sufficient women in their organization? Are they, for instance, all in secretarial roles? Or are there any in technical roles? How many are there on the senior management team and on the board? So asking questions like that. And once you have data on these things, um, it makes arguing the case for more women much, much easier. There have been too few women in senior roles in scientific organizations and industry. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that answer and uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. It, is, uh, it has been an uh, honour and an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity, Alfredo. Good to talk with you. Thank you. <laughs>